It's nice to be here. Uh, I'm Chris Blakesley from UW Madison, Wisconsin. Chris is from University of New Mexico, as was introduced. <laughs> so we are excited to be here and talk about mobile media and a project that has been going for about four years now. And actually, about three years ago, we were members of our team were here discussing this project as it was just beginning. And so it's nice to be here and kind of give an update of what's happened and challenges we're facing now. The tone, the angle we really decided to take was to discuss sustainability issues that we're facing. This has been, you know, our, our expectations have been exceeded. So, so far it's been a successful open source project. And, you know, as, as we look back at what's happened, we see some key open events that have happened that we think are worth sharing. So we want to share those with you and also share what issues we're facing now uh, and you know hopefully that can be a fruitful discussion. So there are four main things we want to we're going to talk about. We want to describe well we're going to talk about why mobile, why we chose this as a, an area of inquiry and then we want to talk about um, describe ARIS, this tool, and then Kind of give the, some background story of Eris in terms of its mobile development, and then discuss these uh, sustainable sustainability issues that I would think are worth talking about. Okay, so before I get started, if I, I know there's at least one iPhone in the audience. If you want to go to the App Store and download Eris, A R I S, that would be a great thing to do while you're sitting there. And then if you don't have an iPhone, you just got a laptop there, you might want to go to ErisGames.org. Um, those are kind of our two main public front ends, and, and we'll discuss how they came up uh, within our project a little bit later on. So the first thing is just to situate why mobile and kind of where we are. So why is kind of obvious. Mobile's freaking huge. Um, I mean, just unbelievably huge. Soon we'll, be, we'll have more mobile phones on the planet than people. Very soon. This is, a, this is a June 2011, um, according to Wikipedia. Um, but in schools and in prisons, we, the most popular take on mobile is to ban and confiscate. Um, despite all the research otherwise as to what might be good, this is, this is sort of the biggest picture of what's going on out there. It's not effective, and it's not a good idea. So um, the idea is to actually make things for mobile, um, and this, this is probably the most common sort of thing that, that we encounter in terms of seeing other people take on mobile. Um, we like apps like this. We use them to find out when the buses are coming. But it's not what we do. We do crazy stuff. Um, let's see. This is supposed to be a big mess. Because it is. Um, but it's a lot of fun. And, and the reason why we're all working together, the two of us who are here and the other people who aren't in the room and the people we bring into are the projects that we'll be talking about later on, is because we, feel, we find that mobile is a very exciting place to be. Um, and one of the, the central things that ends up being super exciting about it is it allows us to interact with local place in brand new ways. Um, sometimes we'll attach phones to bikes. Sometimes we'll get a room full of middle schoolers and artists and have them make games together. Sometimes I'll make a game for students within a particular class. Sometimes we'll record birds. Um, Chris, what else is up there that's crazy? That um, well, sometimes we'll have students make their own projects. Like in the Netherlands, um, students draw and create things, but then we'll put them in locations uh, for other people to go through a story. We'll uh, create panoram panoramic images so that that kind of true augmented reality can hold up a tablet or phone and see something uh, overlaid the actual space you're, you're looking at and contextualizing those in meaningful experiences. So we're kind of a, a loosely affiliated group of people who think sort of similarly about mobile. One of the things that came up, thanks to Dave Gagnon, who had this idea as a class project at one point, was to create a software tool that would help us in these investigations, in these implementations, to, to bring us together, although not intentionally, um, but to, to give us a, a tool with which to ask these questions. Um, and that's, that's where Eris comes from. So Eris is Sort of first and foremost, this thing you can download from App Store. It's a game engine for creating these outdoor experiences 
on your cell phone. And rather than try and explain something that's kind of abstract and weird and complicated, and usually we have two hour workshops to get people into, um, Chris is just going to walk you through one of the things that has been developed for ARIS that, that might be a little bit faster um, to get up and running on it. And it's a situated documentary called Dow Day, um, originally written by Jim Matthews. Yeah, so Dow Day, um, it's what, what's the term that's kind of developed around this is a situated documentary. And so I'm just going to walk you through the experience. Say you have your, your phone, you're at the University of Wisconsin Madison, you're, you're outside, and you wonder I wonder who's, if anyone's made something here. So you open up uh, Eris and you look, and there's a game called Dow Day. So you click on it, and it, it tells you this Today is October 18, 1967. The Vietnam War is happening, and protests are happening on campus because Dow Chemical Company is there recruiting students, a company that also um, creates napalm use in the world. So you are, your role is that you're a reporter. And you, your goal, initially, this, you see a little cutscene, and it tells you you need to go and talk to the editor to get your assignment. And so you look on your map, you click the little map, icon and you see your editors over there so you walk over and when you get there the phone vibrates and you see you have a conversation ready and this is your editor and he tells you he gives you your goal your goal is you need to go and interview all these different uh, individuals that represent different perspectives on this issue so you're going to interview a protester interview a faculty may interview somebody from Dowday and so you go, and it, along the way, you're collecting primary documents, actual letters that were used and, and transpired on campus. You continue to walk around, and what we found one of the most memorable moments of this experience is when you get to a point on Baskin Hill, uh, which I think might be the next slide, and you see a video of protesters marching by the actual spot that you're standing in. And and that's just something that's, that's really compelling and interesting and makes that space that much more uh, compelling. So you go through, you interview these people, and it all kind of comes to that climax that there's actually a uh, conflict between police and, and protesters. And, and so that's the situated documentary of Dow Day. Uh, Jim Matthews, who created this originally, had it as part of a larger class experience where students would come and and do these things, and then they have this experience to draw on as they, in class, analyze these documents and have discussions about, about this issue. So, okay. yeah, so yeah, so that's, that's the app. And it, AIR stands for Augmented Reality for Interactive Storytelling. And so the other end is not just sort of hearing the stories, being the position of playing Dow Day, but trying to make it possible for pretty much anyone to be able to tell these stories as well. And so this is a screenshot of our online editor. It's a URL you go to. Um, it's a flex environment. There's a map on there. It's drag and drop. There's some buttons to click. It's pretty easy to use. Like I said, an hour or two, we'd have you up and running, and you can make your own hidden historical tour, no problem. Um, the other the piece that ties all these together is on the back end, Eris is a, just a MySQL database. So these are tables and tables and tables, and the editor writes to the tables and reads from the tables, and so does the, the client software on the iPhone. So that's, in a nutshell, what Eris is, and then once we made it, it enabled us to carry out all these investigations using it for all or part of those. So like, I teach classes where Eris is used as a design tool to investigate the city. I um, create games to be part as, played as part of the Spanish curriculum. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, we host workshops for youth, for folklorists, for librarians. Uh, I don't know, all that messy stuff I was talking about before, Eris becomes a tool that we can do those things with. And maybe one thing to interject yeah. on that is that uh, we really, the, the idea behind Eris is that with all this messy, crazy things happening, that's really exciting to us because we don't, we don't see Eris as a, an open source alternative to established software. For instance, you have OpenOffice to Microsoft Word. But as Chris mentioned earlier, mobile, we don't know what the affordances are yet. We know like, banning and keeping them contained is one thing to do, but it doesn't help us know what we can do with this for learning and education with this mobile technology. So 
it's more of a, a call for people to come and explore with us. And so it's an enabling platform. And so now what we're going to do is sort of describe Eris. Now we'd like to give you a background of some key moments along the history of Eris that we hope can be helpful to those of you who perhaps are involved in your own open source projects and are looking for um, some good ideas. Yeah, and just in general, again, so the idea being that we were doing this crazy stuff, a few of us together, and all along the way, at different moments in time, we found that the key to our success has been opening it up and bringing more people into the conversation um, from a variety of different areas. So this is, this is sort of those moments. Right, so there's four phases we'll walk through. So from the, at the, in the beginning, uh, this started as a class project. Uh, visual, who had the vision uh, was Dave Gagnon. It was a class by Professor Kurt Squire, who also was key in helping this project have a vision and get off the ground. The initial idea was a game called Get In With Warhol, where the, the say you're in a museum, and usually in an art class, I think what's typical is you, you might go there and you're supposed to look at a piece of art and know who, read the plaque next to it, and know who is, who made it, when they lived. We wanted to foster a more deep interaction with art, so we created an interactive story. We wanted players to come into a museum and we picked Andy Warhol exhibit, which was happening at the Milwaukee Mu Museum at the time. And you became kind of a Forrest Gump character, where you were a fictionalized character in this social circle that Andy Warhol had around him. And as you went to each painting, different events would be triggered, and, and these characters, whoever made that painting would be a character you would interact with and discuss, and they might ask you to do things. For instance, Roy Lichtenstein asks you to deliver a Campbell soup can to Andy Warhol. And then later you might see that that became one of Andy Warhol's paintings. So there's this fictional uh, mode of making meaning around this that will make it more compelling than just seeing a static image and, and not really meaning anything to you. So in one semester, we, Dave Gagnon created uh, these spreadsheets and we constructed as we could this experiment. We learned a lot from it and <clears throat> decided there was something there to this project that could extend beyond the class. So then uh, Sean Dickers was another uh, student who collaborated with David Gagnon and I to make a second <coughs> experiment. We went to the Madison Capitol and we made a Da Vinci Code-like experience where we, want, we picked out different exhibits that people might not otherwise see and we had them, and we created puzzles around them so the students would really have to delve deep into what they were and understand them to make progress into saving uh, a fictional scientist called Dr. Hernandez. And this was, uh, and I'm in a way happy to say this, it was a failure. It was a failure we, that we learned a lot from. We made it a huge narrative, very elaborate, there was time travel, uh, but we learned that uh, it just became, scope creep was, was huge. It was too much to manage and you know, I think it's still yet to be played by anyone other than us. And so, we, this really was helpful for us to shift our alignment to, we just want to create small design experiments that people can play quickly and work from there before we make it this huge elaborate uh, experience that, that we just can't, don't have the time or means to, to make. So, at the end of this phase, we put the open source code, we put the code of Eris, uh, out on the web. We wanted others to see it. We wanted to see what would happen if we if we put it out there. Anything you want to say about that? Um, just that you guys announced that at uh, Open Education 2008. Right. That's when yeah, it was officially <laughs> officially put out there. There was no turning back after announcing that anyone could take this. We adopted an MIT open source license, so that anyone can still can take this code and do as they'd like to. So, like Chris said, put the code out there. It's legally available. Um, one can download it, but who's going to download it? If no one even played his game other than his kids. Um, so you have to have other people using your stuff before it can go anywhere. 
And with something crazy like this, you have to have someone who's dumb enough to use it even though it's pretty bushly. And I, back in 2009, that was me. Early 2009, I'm, I'm dumb enough to hear about this era software that my old friends in Madison are making and decide to adopt it as my platform for creating augmented reality place-based games for Spanish curriculum. Um, we work with a, a professor in Spanish and Portuguese, Dr. Julie Sykes, and we say, let's make a game that takes place in a local neighborhood that's going to be great. Um, what are we going to use? I looked back at the platforms I used to use as a grad student to create this kind of content, and downloads were no longer available, the teams had been broken up, the grant cycles were over, there wasn't stuff out there. Um, and found Eris, almost used Google Sites as my game engine for like, about that, that short, but it didn't render properly on mobile devices at the time. So I ended up using Eris, um, and, I, and we created Mentira. So uh, put this game together in the spring, had a first pilot run in the summer of 2009, um, ran it with a, a 202 class at the University of New Mexico in, in fall of 2009, ran it two classes in 2010, Right now, we're running it with all six sections of Spanish 202 as part of their curriculum. It's a murder mystery. It takes place in a nearby neighborhood. It's kind of like where in the world is Carmen San Diego or choose your own adventure kind of story. Um, and students actually travel in the neighborhood to play the game. It's been a lot of fun to work on the project. And moreover, working on that project, deciding to take this tool and do things with it that it really wasn't ready to do um, and that maybe no one else is ready to try push the tool forward, it pushed the group back in Madison forward, thinking that this might actually go somewhere. Um, it pushed me into the group. I became a member of the core design team within about eight months of, of picking this thing up. Um, did you have a burning a question? question? Yeah, so for this game to work, do you, do you have to go to the different places like the Madison game, or this is more I can tap to say I want to go to this? A little bit of both. And, and that was actually part of the ways in which I was pushing on it real hard, is we, we wanted to give these students iPods for about a month. And so we wanted them to play part of the game as homework, but then go to the neighborhood for part of the game. And Eris wasn't really meant to do that at the time. Now, a year and a half later, it's great at it. Um, and that's been one of the, the really interesting effects of, of how the platform has evolved in concert with people using it. And I'm sort of the first example of that. So that's. So this is the first place where we have someone sort of accessing the tool. Um, you need to have access in order, to, um, in order to get it to go anywhere. But there's some other things that came up um, starting in the, the summer of 2010. In June 2010, there were some other developments in Eris that were real important for pushing it out there. Um, what is this editor? The shot I showed you before, this way of creating Eris games didn't exist before. Um, before, you were manually editing entries and tables, or I was and no one else was willing to do that and could keep it straight. Um, but, but putting this out in June 2010 was a big moment for us. This is usable by other people. Um, there's also the app. Putting something out on the App Store is a whole new level of access over putting something on a Google Code repository. Um, it has lots of implications. And the App Store and, and developing for iOS is nowhere near as closed as I imagined it was before I got into it, and as even even to this day, people don't realize that you can release something without going through the App Store. All you need is an enterprise license. Um, so we've released an interior this way at certain times. But having Eris on the App Store, so you all can download it right now and start playing with it, is a real big boon. And then the other thing is our public face, um, ErisGames.org. That was also launched in June 2010 as a way for people to find out about what we're doing and how to get involved. I had a quick question. So yeah. you said for Mentira, you released a account. Oh, it's not on the app store, so it's Curr search currently, if you want to play Mentira, it's in Eris. Mm -hmm. Download Eris, search for so Mentira. It's It'll auto correct you to Mentor. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned something else about enterprise. Yeah, I'll, I can talk to you later about it. It's probably a little off topic at this okay. point, but it is more open than I imagined and, and easy to do. Um, so that that was sort of our second phase, putting things out there and, in a way that people might actually start using. Um, and what we experienced after that is this period of massive growth. Right. What we, so with that foundation set to help people have access to this tool, we wanted, and seeing the fruits that, that came from this relationship with Chris and how this tool could be informed by the process of him asking for features and us able to create those features, uh, prioritize them, 
we wanted more of that to happen. And so we thought, one thing that became, I think, central early on uh, as a kind of conventional wisdom that we bought into was that this all needs to be around the tool. People don't want to just go to a website, or at least the project won't grow if, it, if it's just information we're putting out there. But we want something people can use and take and apply to what they're doing. And that's what, we'll, that's what will keep people coming. And so how can we promote that? Up to this point, we had adopted an agile programming um, development cycle, where a lot of times we called internal game jams, where we, as a team, would spend block out a day, two days, three days, and just work on a feature, try making a game, you know, push the edges of this tool to make it better. So we thought, why not do this globally? We'd heard of, of game design jams, so we decided to hold a global game jam with Eris, and this was one that. Uh, we held, we go to the dates on these. What was it was April 18th through 20th this year. Right. Huge watershed moment mm -hmm. for us. And we wanted 50 games in 50 hours. So we, we said, set aside three days wherever you are. And we, we had students from K-12 schools come in to work with artists and researchers. And here in Madison was kind of the home base, but we had um, 10 to 20 other bases around the country and around the world. Essentially invited everyone we could get a hold of through our website, through our personal networks, yeah. just everyone. Anyone who wants to come make games for three days. And we wanted everyone to feel that kind of buzz and, and excitement of it, of the, an event like this. So we used Adobe Connect to have people video conference in. And we had people from the Netherlands, uh, a team from Spain that have, were also early uh, partners in asking for features and using the tool. Even a 12-year-old boy in Colombia who emailed and, and said he just wanted to make some cool games, uh, he, he joined as well. So you know, it, was, it was a success. There were, I think, 114 games were made total. So 20 of them were really showcased and, and playable that, that everyone, that the authors talked about at the end of, of the event. So this graph um, is shows, represents hits to the ericsgames.org website. And it's interesting to see with these three events that were held around designing using the tool, you see that uh, interest just kind of grow. Even so, though it's dipping some, it's, it's gradually rising. If people can't read that, that line that we're just barely peeking above at the Global Game Jam, it is a thousand hits in a week. Um, so pretty big growth for us in this last year in terms of the uh, number of people trying to figure out what this is about, getting involved. Um, hmm. And it all seems to be organized around these public events that we host. Um, some other aspects of, of how we're trying to encourage community participation. This is, this is Lighthouse. I don't know if anyone's used that for, for bug tracking or feature tracking. We use that as a, a front end for people who are, you know, um, not coding on the project, but want to give feedback as to what needs to be fixed and what could be better. Um, so we've been using that for the last several months. Um, internally, we use Pivotal Tracker to keep track of all the things that need to get done and to prioritize features and stuff like that. Those have both been really good tools um, that talk to each other really well um, that we've made use of. Um, another thing that's happened in this last year is we've been partnering with fairly large organizations. Um, museums that want us to design a co-design an experience with them. Um, other museums who want to run youth design and want us to help with that. Um, other people who are interested in trying to figure out how to do something with both mobile media and, and <clears throat> local place, let's say. Yeah, and in terms of sustainability, what financially has been effective so far is that these these uh, organizations have access to the tool, so they could, in theory, take it and just run with it. But what they've wanted is expertise around the tool. And so they've said, we will give you this block of money for, we're hoping to get these features, and we'd also love you to come out for a few days and maybe help us run a workshop, help us all get on board and understand the process of designing, uh, and, and we'll go from there. And who knows, maybe your relationship will happen after that, or maybe we'll just, say that's great and go on our separate ways but yeah 
So just a quick view. Back in at GLS 2011, we did a snapshot of how many games, players, and editors there were. Last night, we did the same thing. And those figures have roughly doubled in the last four months. Um, we've seen huge uptick in the amount of people using this platform. These are the last, these are the Ares games that have been played in the last month. We have six games that have had 50 unique people play them in the last month. Um, and Tira, of course, being used in a classroom, it's way at the top of the list. Um, we also have 12 games with over 25 players, so this classic sort of long tail picture. 302 games have been played by two or more people in the last month. Um, we couldn't have imagined this many people actually sort of engaging with the platform a year ago. Um, so pretty amazing for us. We're entering into a new period where there's a lot of excitement. We're having a lot of fun doing this kind of stuff, and it's getting big and it's getting complicated. And this is where we're maybe looking for advice from, from anyone around here is, how do we put together some sort of formal structure that makes things like legal stuff, like paying for t-shirts, like um, you know, just all that crap easy and doable without ruining all the fun that we're having. So um, we don't know if it's a nonprofit, we don't know if it's LLC, we don't know how to manage those things. Also with sort of trying to keep in mind the idea of very loose ownership that we have around both this product and these ideas right now. Um, we really like to maintain those. What yes. are some other things we want to try and well, you know, development, you know, programmers making these features is a, is, is a bottleneck often. There will be, and there are now, more features than, than we have uh, programmers to handle. So how do we hire enough developers to work on these things? What kind of a structure? Because it, it, it has worked to some extent within our university structure, but it's starting to get so big that it doesn't really quite fit within a university. So how do we get enough pro a programmer house where it's not necessarily you pay for a feature and we give it to you, but it's a, a larger community that is flexible. So I definitely encourage you all to both give us free advice um, <laughs> and to join our community, start making games, start talking to us about what, what you would like to make. Um, anything mm -hmm. else, Chris? Well, let's I, open up for questions. I'm yeah. sure, so like, I'm trying to see like how's the sustainability, like this is an awesome free service, like I'm really excited to try to make my own game. I might be even more excited if I could take my own game and then put it on the App Store. You can. And so I could. Yeah. I could. You I can could release code. ARI 5 with the exact same code base to the App Store tomorrow under the MIT license. Interesting. And so um, I could rechange it so if I, uh, like Material Part 2, I could release in the App Store. Yeah. And you're, that, I love that that doesn't worry you, you're not... No, sure. no, yeah. Okay. As long as you're not Pearson, that would just make it hurt in my soul. <laughs> Nothing against Pearson, but you know, it doesn't feel fair competing with the little guys. Interesting. Um, cool. And that, like, why, what, why have you chosen not to take some of your like? Why have you not done that with material for other games? Oh, because um, so Mantuna was sort of released, just not through the App Store as its own app without a game picker, as a sort of a forked version of Eris. And there've been a couple other examples of those kinds of things. Um, basically, it's just that Eris got a whole bunch of new features that I wanted to use, and I don't have the money or time to worry about how to, you know, shoot out that little bit of code to the App Store. And, and actually, a good example of that. It could happen. Let me see if I can skip ahead. These are extra slides that we might <laughs> and we might not get. These to. are all the crazy things we're going to try this year. Right. Arduinos. We're going to make fountains go off when you complete your games. Um, we're going to connect to web apps. Um, Anyway, and and yeah, and just to data collection to finish this this point of, on how you could create your own app. Weebird is an app that was created using Air software, but it's actually an app that a professor is making and is going to be independent. Where you can collect, you're outside, you can record a bird call, and with like 99.9% .9 accuracy, it'll show you the bird you're listening to, and that can feed into science databases to inform, so it's a, a form of civic engagement, uh, or citizen science, rather. So we're done. Happy to talk to people later, though. Um. <laughs> Are you doing a poster thing this afternoon? We're not. We're not. That's we'll awesome. be there, though. Yeah, we'll be around. <laughs> Let's congratulate Chris and Chris for the presentation. Thank, Thank you. you.